Okay, so now we're going to switch to the first of our two keynote talks. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Donald Holborn. Um, many of you will be familiar with Donald. He's been involved with GBIF for a long time. He recently took on the role of his executive secretary. Um, so he essentially runs the entirety of the GBIF program and um, is hugely influential and has been hugely influential in terms of the development of the whole field of biodiversity informatics. And we gave him this rather challenging title of GBIF and the biodiversity informatics landscape. So I'm looking forward to hear what Donald has to say. Donald Holman. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Vince. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, certainly, uh, the Natural History Museum and all it represents uh, is uh, at the heart of what GBIF has always been and what it's always aspired to be, uh, although I believe we've got decades of our own to get to where we would really like to be. Um, I'm going to, uh, I've been given this grand title and I've got about 20, 25 minutes to try and cover things, so I will, I will be brief and focus on just a few things. First of all, since, does this work or do I? Okay, that's good. Um, since since the, uh, the title includes GBIF and I'm here representing GBIF, uh, I assume most of you are aware of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. It's been in existence uh, since 2001. Uh, it represents a collaboration between a significant number of governance, governments and international organizations uh, with the mission of mobilizing biodiversity information. Now, uh, I believe that really this, this vision that biodiversity information should be freely and universally available for science, society and a sustainable future should relate to all aspects of everything the human race knows about the world's biodiversity. And that clearly goes a long way beyond the areas that the GBIF work program uh, covers. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that apart from certain uh, roles we've played in supporting uh, the mobilization of species checklists uh, in collaboration with activities such as Species 2000, the Catalog of Life, uh, the vast majority of what GBIF has done has been to focus on one specific problem, which is the organization of the evidence we have for the recorded occurrence of any species at any time and place. Uh, it's a little bit loose where our paleo data is almost non-existent and we've not taken that seriously. But that uh, is effectively uh, the goal we're focused on. And in particular, uh, going back to the origins of GBIF, the focus has always been on natural history collections as being the repository for vouchered uh, and therefore in principle high quality data uh, that includes not only uh, contemporary uh, observations of where species have been found but also very importantly for many of the questions uh, that Vince indicated in his slides uh, the kind of information that helps us to look back into the past and understand a little bit more about some of the, the distributions and patterns for species. So um, right now, this is the distribution of GBIF uh, participants. I ignore the colors. It, it's, it's all to do with governance. Um, however, as, as you can see, we have uh, very broad uh, participation across Western Europe uh, and the Americas, uh, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, very strong, a scattering of uh, other countries, uh, but still some very significant gaps. Uh, and that's reflected uh, after 12 years in the actual coverage of data. Um, and talking about this as coverage is immediately glossing over many things because uh, even though we're here now talking about more than 400 million records of some species having been recorded at some time and place with some kind of evidence for that assertion, uh, for many species it's just one or two uh, records. Uh, in many cases uh, there may be records here which have never been identified down uh, even to the genus level, let alone to the species level. But it gives an indication uh, of the spread that, uh, that we're now seeing. And the patterns uh, become more obvious as you move in close. You see uh, shipping lanes, you see uh, grid-based survey activities, uh, you see centers of population, roads, uh, national parks, etc., as very obvious uh, centers of interest. I think the situation that GBIF finds itself in after uh, 12 years 
is that it is now a proven infrastructure. It has a global set of practices and a global network that is increasingly effective and recognized as effective in managing and organizing uh, this type of data from many different sources, uh, supporting uh, very different communities and different language groups uh, in contributing to a globally integrated view. However, there is a great deal more to do, and I'm going to spend most of the, the rest of uh, this presentation talking about some of those aspects, because issues around quality, around provenance, around understanding uh, just how much evidence there is, understanding who the authority is for the identification for a particular record, the ability to know whether or not the coordinates um, are reliable or whether they're um, based on uh, somebody guessing potentially uh, what a locality name represents. All of these are critical issues. Understanding uh, the meaning of uh, the statistical significance of data brought together from so many different sources, uh, some of it uh, very ad hoc, um, as I would argue uh, much collections-based data really is, uh, some of it much more systematically organized through uh, field activities such as atlasing or long-term monitoring projects. All of these have different strengths, different weaknesses, uh, and I don't think yet we've solved all of the problems as to how we deliver that information robustly to users in a way that helps them to make the best possible judgments of these things. However, um, as a positive note, um, later this year, um, October, um, GBIF, uh, similarly to some of the things that have been described here for the museum, will be revamping its own portal and it, its web infrastructure. Uh, these are snapshots of the, uh, the current, it's somewhere between alpha and beta at the moment, I think, uh, website uh, that we've been developing. Uh, it uh, offers basically similar sorts of functions to those that you find right now in the GBIF website, although uh, much more scalability and zooming on the maps, and probably more interesting for most researchers, much more flexibility in being able to uh, download data uh, for various kinds of analyses and purposes. Uh, up to now, uh, the GBIF network has really ended up uh, de facto placing some quite significant restrictions on how easy it is, uh, particularly to get larger data sets uh, out, of, out of the system. And, and a lot of these problems are going to be solved. And uh, from the standpoint of those who are publishing data, uh, there will also be much more rapid uh, response on the GBIF side uh, for seeing those changes reflected in the data index and, and being discoverable. Uh, the goal is that uh, if somebody uh, registers a data set in the GBIF network, uh, it will immediately start indexing it um, and within a matter of minutes or, even, or, or hours, uh, it'll be possible for the, uh, the publisher to see whether or not the data have been interpreted in the way they intended and potentially to uh, fix some things and, and upload again. So a lot of, a lot of rather technical um, improvements to the infrastructure that I think will make a big difference for many users, uh, but I think still only scratching at the surface of some of the real problems. So the problems. Um, sorry. Let's take this, uh, this example here. Um, imagine a weevil. Uh, in a natural history collection somewhere, uh, and a curator, uh, as part of their 20 million specimens, uh, entering the, the label information for this specimen uh, into an institutional system and sharing that through something like GBIF network. A, a, a distribution modeler may find this record through GBIF or some other route uh, and decide to use it as part of some uh, some view they're building, perhaps um, trying to understand whether or not this is likely to, uh, to spread or be impacted uh, under climate change scenarios. Uh, somebody else uh, may recognize that, in fact, those coordinates are nowhere near Germany, and so they may just reject the record. Um, they probably won't or may have difficulty in notifying the, uh, the source institution of the fact they've found a problem. Somebody else may recognize that, in fact, it's just the coordinates have been transposed fix it for their own purposes and go on happily. But still, uh, no benefit, no improvement uh, in the source data record. Uh, and then, of course, if a taxonomist comes in and recognizes that this, this beetle was misidentified all along, everybody's been wasting their time, at least if they've really been that narrowly uh, interested in a specific species. Uh, and 
none of this, again, typically uh, in today's world, at very least makes a quick change to the, uh, the view we have of the data. And I believe that this reflects a world in which the, uh, what I would characterize from Vince's past presentation as, as, as a paper-based knowledge base, a world in which what we're doing is taking some of that analog information and putting it up in the window for people to see, but not yet serious about a full-scale shift from that analog world to a truly digital one. Um, and what I'd like to suggest is that uh, for my um, view out over the next few decades, our focus should be on enabling a globally connected digital knowledge base for all of that analog information. Um, and that is clearly an enormous and expensive challenge, but I think we have many of the tools in our hands right now for going down that path. And if we think more broadly of the world in which we live, if we think of um, financial markets, uh, medical systems, uh, obviously climate and weather, uh, we live in a world where we expect up-to-date predictions and models based on historical and contemporary data and trends uh, in order to inform all kinds of aspects of our lives. Our governments expect these things, uh, industry and corporations do as well. Uh, we live in a world which is increasingly driven by uh, models that are based on digital data. Uh, and as, as Vince says, for all of the chal challenges and the, uh, the questions that I think may rightly be asked about what is realistically going to be feasible for building full-scale models of um, entire ecosystems and of life itself, uh, there is some first-order approximation that we can make, or at least some rudimentary starts we can make towards um, being able to represent some aspects of life in a way that could inform decisions by our governments for planning, um, could inform intergovernmental activities such as the CBD, um, and uh, indeed help to drive whole new questions at the level of ecology and taxonomy um, itself. So if we turn this around and think of a different world, uh, in this world, yet again, the curator somehow places a digital record out for the world to see uh, based on uh, the, the specimen uh, in the collection. And here, uh, the only difference you can see is that I've given a version number to this digital record in this particular case. Uh, and I put it in a, in a little dotted space which indicates that somehow everyone sees this and everyone can work on this record. So, the first thing is that somebody uses this and they, they, um, they, they, they perhaps go ahead and build their model, which may have some, um, some erroneous basis because of it. Uh, the second user does detect that there was a problem and flags the issue. They may not yet realize um, exactly what the problem is, but they know that this doesn't come uh, within the specified country. It could even be an automated tool uh, that gets us to this point. Um, and so we have version two of the record, which says this is what the record says, but um, there's a, an issue has been reported. The third user may come in, and this is highly simplified. It could well be that there were entire workflows of confirmation. Yes, you're right, we got the coordinates wrong. Uh, but we're moving towards an improved view of this data record. And then uh, when the taxonomist re-identifies it, or when subsequent work takes place in the institution, uh, this specimen gets imaged or sequenced, all of this is somehow seen as connected, accessible, and immediately improving the, uh, the digital representation of that analog world of the collection. Um, and what is suggested here is that nothing is lost, that somebody finds out something, somebody records some information, and somehow that needs to be visible and acceptable to everyone else. And I, I believe that there are presentations later today on linked open data, which would certainly be one of the paths we could look at for achieving some of these things without necessarily going down some super gen bank type path of having to put all information in some primary form in, in one place. Uh, and the beauty of this is that if we get this right and if we can reference everything, then all of the secondary products, the models, the uh, the monographs, uh, the, the subsequent interpretations of these data that follow on from, uh, from what's been recorded can themselves be connected, discoverable, traceable. 
uh, and people can follow these paths backwards and forwards. So in this case, the modeler's model, um, hopefully this time for the right species, uh, ends up uh, connected. So what I wanted to think about in, in the remaining minutes I've got are some of the things, some of the most foundational things we need together in order to get to this point. Because the technologies are not necessarily that hard. There are many challenges that um, each institution, each organization faces itself around how it overcomes or the degree to which it is ready to go down the path of um, participating fully in a digital and particularly a free and open digital world, which is what I'll be arguing is particularly important. But there are certain things that we need at a global level to start thinking about buying into, and I'm going to talk about some of those. Um, I'm not going to talk about data standards because they're even more boring than some of the other things. Many of you I've sat in data standards development workshops. It's important, um, just, and, and there's a lot more work still to do in that area, but it's something that our community as a whole has actually been pretty good at working on over the years. Um, and when I look at the, the state of data standardization, even in some uh, fields that are, were totally born digital, I'm always amazed at, at how much uh, the, the taxonomic and commu collections community actually has got right. But I'm going to think about some of these other things. First of all, persistent storage. This is the, uh, the most worrying thing, I think, of all. That um, of the 405 million records in the GBIF network today, uh, there is a significant proportion, um, and it's, it, it's in at least the eight digits, that um, no longer are accessible on the web except in the GBIF index. Uh, data sets that were put online, um, made publicly available uh, through the GBIF data sharing agreement. The intention at the time that GBIF was started was that it should really just be a federated search across many data sets. Uh, and certainly we still are not in a position where GBIF itself regards itself as a long-term archival repository for anything, uh, but realistically, um, if you want to find those records, the place you can get them from is from our data index, uh, with all the loss of detail that that may imply uh, in comparison with the original data sets uh, from which they came. And that, I believe, is the most fundamental challenge we face, that uh, whether it's in a scratch pad, whether it's digitizing a natural history collection, whether it's taking a photograph, a sequence, whatever else, if we have some digital artifact, some object that represents a, a set of facts or assertions, measurements, observations about biodiversity, we want to be able to refer to it in a reliable way into the future. We want to be able to retrieve it. We want to be able to curate and improve it in any ways we can. And GBIF has struggled with this over the last better part of a decade. Uh, thinking about how to establish a workable approach for persistent um, identifiers for data records and data sets uh, and other artifacts. But in fact, whilst we can do a lot to put some of the mechanics in place, the real issue remains the question of whether or not the digital objects themselves have been placed in some kind of institutional or national or um, I suppose, collaborative environment in which there is some real confidence that they will still be retrievable in a, a complete form in 10 years, 20 years, perhaps even many more decades than that. Uh, and this is, this is an issue which perhaps our science peculiarly faces, um, that we care about uh, the history of very specific objects uh, from decades and centuries past. But somehow, if we're interested in these data and if we believe these data have relevance, uh, we've got to get more serious about finding ways uh, to get real guarantees uh, for that long-term um, archival. Um, and when we've done that, then we can start referring reliably to the objects, curating them, um, and treating, as in uh, my slide earlier, uh, every annotation, every correction, somehow as a proposed new version uh, for the same uh, data record. A second thing which um, probably um, overcomes anything that Vince was talking about in terms of dullness is the culture of open reuse when expressed in terms of data licenses. Um, 
Uh, data licenses, I think, are really important. Um, the, uh, the world is increasingly familiar with Creative Commons licenses. There are also open data commons licenses that are more specifically targeted towards um, digital assets and, and, and databases. Um, the thing that is important here is that unless we have the ability for any arbitrary object, image, uh, data record that we found, find on the web to know how liberal um, the, uh, the publisher intended to be in making that object available. And if we, so I've, I've, I've lost my negatives in this, but we have to understand that. We have to understand um, what we are entitled to do and what our obligations are uh, in making use of this object. Some things are effectively uh, ceded to the public domain. Others are under licenses that indicate at very least attribution is required, and that probably reflects uh, good scientific practice anyway. Um, there's a, a piece in um, this month's bioscience uh, on that subject. Um, at the same time, though, we find that many digital objects are published with weird text restrictions as well as those that are uh, encoded in digital licenses. Um, and when users seek to aggregate information from dozens, perhaps hundreds of different sources, realistically understanding whether a particular institution would think that what they were about to do with the data was somehow for a commercial purpose or um, for them to have to hunt down um, some additional documentation on the institutional website is an enormous challenge at, at very least. Um, and um, commercial, non-commercial is, is probably the biggest pitfall we face uh, because it is exceedingly difficult to define um, and much that goes on in our world is effectively um, in the eyes of most people not for profit but probably from the eyes of a uh, standpoint of a lawyer maybe can still consider commercial. So there's, there's a lot of issues we've got to solve but we really need to be in a good position to understand how we can use all of the objects uh, safely and reliably uh, in line with the intentions of the users. Now the third thing I just wanted to emphasize, I'm going to use a couple of citizen science examples here, um, not because I couldn't have done some of this uh, by going and picking some scratch pads examples, but because I think this, this suggests a few things of, of real importance. If we are going to do this right, if we are going together to curate the world's knowledge of biodiversity, we need to be able to mobilize all of the expertise there is, wherever it is, and to be able to make good use of that expertise according to just how expert it really is. There are now thousands of amateurs in the UK who can probably reliably identify 90% of the macro moths in this country uh, from a photograph. There are the others which are difficult, but 90% probably without too much difficulty. That expertise uh, is reflected also in many other northern European countries. At the same time, there is uh, typically a greater expertise that is represented um, in what is known by the taxonomists on specific groups, uh, many field ecologists and others. And somehow, what we really need is a mechanism to allow everyone to stand around the data and make their contributions and corrections uh, in a way that um, isn't a whole new task upon them, but it somehow fits in with their their day-to-day -day activities and actually improves their own work. Um, but which ties back to who made this assertion, who's agreed with that assertion, and therefore whether or not, in a moderately automated preliminary way, at least we can we can trust those kinds of things. And the the iSpot site. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with it. There are certainly um, quite a few uh, museum staff who are involved in, in some of the groups on, on this site. Um, it has established something of a self-tuning mechanism for understanding something of the confidence around different uh, contributors' expertise, uh, and this specifically in the area of identification. Um, and I think it's interesting for us to think about what would be the, the mechanisms that we would need to have in place in a decade. I don't see this as coming quickly. So that a taxonomist in, um, in Russia, um, a field naturalist in the UK, uh, a, an ecologist in some other part of the world could actually work together um, on curating the, uh, the data on a particular group of species, for example. 
how would that work and how would they be able together to build a more and more trusted uh, version of the truth. And just to indicate that even though citizen science projects by and large are um, relating to um, to recording um, records of um, just of the occurrence of species in many cases. Um, uh, certainly looking at the iNaturalist site, which is a, another pri more primarily US-based site, uh, some of these tools are completely hidden away, the amount of work that's gone into some of these things. But they've already started to implement tools for at least um, for, for at least uh, th those splits that, um, that are, are geographically uh, easily uh, easily uh, addressed uh, within the taxonomy of species. So here, grey fantails in Australasia. Uh, recently, uh, according to uh, Christidis uh, and Bowles, uh, it's two species across the Tasman. And so they've, in, they've gone in, they've added a mapping tool that said the splits occurred here, and you, pro you probably can't see, is that then the observers are being prompted to ask whether or not they confirm that this automated changed their record to the new taxonomy is accepted. Um, these, are, these are small items and, and they're the kind of items which uh, scratch pads in various ways has also been working on solving many of these kinds of problems and you could imagine many of these things being plugged together in interesting ways but somehow um, the ability for somebody to record the details of a taxonomic split whether or not we've all accepted it and for the implications on the data then to be sifted by the community uh, needs to occur. Now, I've almost finished, but I'm going to show a, a rather dull, but I think important diagram. Um, Vince mentioned the, uh, the, the report, which um, I apologize to anybody with an interest in this. It's taken us a year since uh, last July's, more than a year, uh, last July's conference. That, that's not July this year, that's July 2012, um, in order to get to producing the report. Um, in some ways, it's not a report. It's more of a a framework document for biodiversity informatics, uh, but it, it, it will indeed be uh, released in the next few weeks. Um, we, we brought together uh, around 100 um, experts uh, in various aspects of biodiversity science, informatics and policy, um, and spent three days looking at the kind of problems that we wished biodiversity informatics was solving, including the high-end things like modeling uh, the, the ecosphere and uh, as well as the Aichi targets um, and tried to think about what would be required to take the bits and pieces we have today in projects like GVIF, Catalogue of Life, Encyclopedia of Life, institutional activities um, and put them together to something that might actually start to address some of those questions. Um, and in doing so, um, we, we've really come up with four broad areas of focus and each of these has multiple building blocks in and I'm not going to go into all the detail right now. But the things that I've been talking about just now, the the licensing, the persistent storage, the culture of being able to work together in a collaborative fashion uh, to curate uh, a, an open shared pool of biodiversity data and knowledge um, is, is what's here referred to as infrastructure. I've drawn this as a big box because it envelops everything else. We need this to be the culture in which we live for everything. The, the second big area that uh, we need to focus on and the 20 million, which excites me very greatly, um, is, um, is a part of this. It's taking the, the analog assets we have today and turning them into digital forms. It's not necessarily worrying about some perfect ontology of everything into which we map things. It's starting the path of getting them to be digital and accessible um, with some interpretation of the fields that can be interpreted, but in a form that makes it easy for the Laos taxonomists or for those managing the biota of a particular area to continue to create and improve that stuff. This is about the primary data in whatever form it is, getting it available. But the sort of things that GBIF is involved in today, and I would argue that this applies equally to uh, the Catalog of Life, Encyclopedia of Life and many others, is trying to provide a particular lens into all of that formally analog information, a particular view for a particular purpose. In GBIF's case, like I said, it's trying to organize the evidence that we have for what species have been recorded at what time and what place and um, what is the basis of that evidence. Is, is, there, a, is there some um, uh, some material that can be revisited? Is there a DNA sequence? Is there a photo? Or is it just an observation which may have been according to somebody who really knew the group? Um, but you know, what's the scale of, scale of evidence? Um, 
and organizing this to provide the best possible view of the available evidence. This is still not, I mean, if taking the, the, the climate, uh, the climatologist's analogy, which um, was, was on that page um, uh, from Drew Purvis's paper, um, we're, we're still not at that stage. This is really about the cleaning, the organizing, uh, and the managing of the primary data in a form that makes it more accessible and more readily available. And if, if all of that primary data is made available under liberal licenses that allow other people to mash it up and reuse it in various ways, then it doesn't just have to be GBIF that thinks of a good way to provide a lens like this that helps us to answer questions. Anybody can join it together uh, in whatever way they wish. But when we have good views, good organized views that link back to the, the, uh, the source of that evidence, then I believe we can start thinking about how we build our models. And that's really where the climatologists have gone. They spent ages cleaning their weather data. Um, but now that's a training data set for all kinds of models. And in the same way, we can move from knowing that, uh, in my example earlier, um, the, uh, the uh, it's not, wasn't a tansy plume, it was a yarrow plume, uh, the plume moth um, on the, the GBIF slide, knowing it's been recorded in these Western European countries, but we've got next to no data from some others, including the UK, bizarrely for, for, for that particular species, um, that, that we can use that to build the best possible model of where we believe the species is actually found and continuously correct and improve that and do the same for all other species and to start to understand based on phylogeny and known data what are likely to be the interactions between those species, what are likely to be the effects of new invasives coming into those environments. I think we can start going down some of those paths uh, but it's a tiered activity. Just two last um, clicks. Um, when we get up to that level of models is the point when I think we start really seriously intersecting with other domains, environment, uh, climate, sociology, etc. cetera. Um, and what comes out of the top of a system like this is really the, the set of um, answers and responses that the likes of the, oh dear, I'm sorry, uh, the likes of the CBD uh, and IPBES and others are looking for assessments and indicators uh, that can help them uh, to make judgments. So I'll stop there. Um, Thank you very much, Donald. Fantastic. So you really covered a huge amount of ground there. Um, so any questions? John. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly Sorry, trusting that there will be some. Oh, okay. Do 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 I see it as the um, the uh, intergovernment? Is it interim or intergovernmental still? It is going to be um, science policy platform and biodiversity and ecos ecosystem services, which now has a um, a developing secretariat in Bonn, um, as somehow a new stage of maturity uh, in these kinds of things, um, and therefore. Uh, in, in relation to GBIP. I, I certainly see it as a, a forum for us to make some serious changes in the degree to which assessments are based genuinely on revisitable data um, and the ability therefore for others to um, assess and respond to those assessments. Um, I'm I'm certainly waiting to see how, how, how the work program pans out. Um, from, from my standpoint, um, looking at it from, from bottom up, um, sit, I, I was sitting in sort of the, the, the second of those two tiers inside my inf infrastructure block. Um, I think it, it, it's a great opportunity, um, but it is challenging because uh, you get to the level where so many, uh, so many large groups of interests are trying to work together that actually getting concrete actions is difficult. Uh, in some ways, I still see GeoBon as a more plausible place for us to start demonstrating some of the things that I wish IPBES would pick up. But even that is, it's, it's a real uphill battle to get to concrete activities there. So I'm quietly optimistic, but um, waiting to see. Any more questions? No, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting two talks. I, I was just thinking a little bit about more from the user base and uh, it's, it's a slightly more philosophical point. So science is often, even though it may sound like a big question, is 
climate change affecting our biota? It's often made up of a series of very specific questions, such as is a particular species of phytoplankton rain shifting in the North Atlantic, or mm. are, for example, are cod fisheries recovering in the North Sea? And these are the these are very specific things that require very specific pieces of information. Mm. And all of the talks so far have been focused on this very broad, big data, joined up data. Mm. And I'd like to see more specific examples. And actually, some of this these approaches driven by those sorts of specific examples. I think that would help us on the sort of the user basis of, of trying to understand sort of philosophically right. how this fits in the in the philosophy of science, I suppose. I, 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 think, I think that's a fair point. And if I hadn't already gone five minutes over my time, I might have said a few more things about that. Um, if you go to the GBIF website, and I think it's under the news link, you'll find, or you just do a Google search for GBIF and GBITS, G-B-I-T-S. Um, the, the, the GBIF newsletter does tend to cherry pick some of the, the published scientific examples, which tend to very often to be much more at that kind of level and shows how they've connected back to the data. Um, the, the new GBIF annual report um, also has a science supplement tucked in the back, uh, which summarizes for 2012 um, somewhere over, over 200 papers in various categories, much like the categories, you know, food, food um, farming and biofuels, I don't think we call it that, but, but those kinds of categories of some of the uses, uh, the applied uses. Um, it, it's clearly important for us to understand how the data are being used, but to go beyond that and start understanding what it is about the existing mobilization of, of content that limits its usefulness in those areas. Um, not necessarily so that we just immediately rush off and try and digitize exactly those things, but at least it then gives us a, a more rational basis for looking at those needs across all those areas and making some decisions. Because it doesn't make sense for us just to pour money into digitizing stuff from A to Z just because we can. Um, we may have a deep-seated desire just to see that happen because it would be so great, uh, but we've got, we've got to be intelligent and, and understand what the real priorities are and what things will actually make real difference soon. Okay, well, maybe one more question, then we must break for coffee. Darren. I, I think so. I, um, I, I, it's, it's, it's one of my big frustrations that um, I feel I've been talking about these issues for seven or eight years at very least, probably better part of a decade, and we don't, I don't feel that right now we're that much closer. However, when you look at um, the number of major government-funded activities around the world that are getting serious about multi-decade data curation, and when you start seeing um, within in the context of GBIF, the number of um, national GBIF nodes that really now are in a position that um, they could establish uh, repositories with, with guarantees for at least this doesn't sound very exciting, but at least the five to 10 year period. I believe that uh, with a little bit of coordination within our network, we could establish a peer to peer model whereby effectively institutions may say, we can guarantee 10 terabytes of storage for the next decade. We don't know what the situation will be beyond that. But in the meantime, we focus on using that as part of a big distributed redundant store. Um, that's where I'd like GBIF to be going in the next few years. Not necessarily the GBIF Secretariat. I think it's more appropriate for national interest to step forward and do that. But a model like that um, could actually allow all kinds of contributors, even um, individual researchers, effectively to be hosting or replicated copies of all the Laos literature and all the Laos data um, as, a, as a redundancy tactic whilst having over the top of it a layer that allowed us to refer persistently to these things. Um, BitTorrent and things like that should have taught us a lot more, I think, than they did. And on that point, I think that's a really good opportunity to break for coffee. So thanks very much, Donald. That's fantastic. Thank you.